retreat this evening, and I'm delighted to present Paul Wainwright to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I am just delightful, delighted to be here uh, tonight. Um, uh, every town had a meeting house, and yours did, and I have a photograph coming up later in my talk. But what I'm going to be showing you with meeting house photographs is what your building would have looked like when it was first built, so stay tuned. Um, I find meeting houses are a, a fascinating chapter of American history that I had either never learned or forgotten about, and so uh, I'm delighted to uh, tell you the story of, uh, of meeting houses. Turn this on, there we go. For me, it all started as an artistic project. Uh, as Susan said, I'm, I love photography and, and I love to photograph old buildings. And uh, in uh, 2004, uh, there was a notice in the little newspaper that we get uh, free every week about an open house in a meeting house. Uh, it was this building in Fremont, New Hampshire, uh, built in 1800. I didn't know anything about meeting houses, but I knew it was an old building, and so I looked up the a uh, person in uh, Fremont who was the historian and made arrangements to come at another time and make some photographs. And I made some absolutely wonderful uh, photographs when I was in this building. I, I love the way light comes through the wrinkly glass that you find in old buildings. And it was all this bare woodwork that hands had, had touched for 200 years. And that's the sort of thing that I really like for, for artistic subjects. And uh, on my way home, I went through Danville and went right past the Danville Meeting House on a road that I had not been on before. Uh, you should notice the date when this building was built. It was built in 1755, which just happens to be the year that your original Meeting House was built. So this was the quintessential Meeting House of the mid-18th century. And you'll see more buildings that look like this. This is basically what your Meeting House 99% probability looked like when it was built. So um, I went through Danville, and now I have a second meeting house, two meeting houses that constitutes an artistic project. And I needed to find where some more of these buildings were located. And went, went and did some research on the internet and came up with two books. The first one is uh, Colonial Meeting Houses of New Hampshire by Eva Speer, uh, published in 1938. She covers most of the meeting houses in New Hampshire. She left a few out, and she had a few from other states. But this got me started with New Hampshire's meeting houses. And as I looked a little further, I came upon this book, Meeting House and Church in Early New England by Edmund Sinnott, uh, published in 1963. This is considered by most historians to be the Bible of colonial meeting houses. He lists in his index 504 structures that existed in 1963 that could trace their roots back to either early churches or meeting houses. 480 of those you would never recognize because they had been repurposed or refashioned into other things. Uh, but it was the 20 or so that still looked in original condition uh, when the Puritans walked out of them 200 years ago that interested me artistically. And so that formed the basis for my artistic project. But as I was reading in these books, I realized that there's, as I said, a whole lot of American history I didn't really know all that much about. There's so much of our, our, not just New England, but national DNA that was uh, developed and evolved in these buildings. And I thought maybe I could bring that story to a larger audience. And that's so where, this is where the talk came from. It's where my book came from that I'll talk about later. And there's also a traveling exhibition of the original prints that is in the permanent collection of the Peabody Essex Museum in uh, Salem, Massachusetts. So that's a little background how I got involved. So what are some of the things that we can trace back to meeting houses that come up again and again from time to time in current events? Um, the first is the whole notion of partic participatory government, town meeting form of government. Does Bedford still have town meetings or are you a Senate Bill 2? Yes. You have town meetings. Uh, we're a Senate Bill 2, but so we have deliberative sessions, but it's almost the same. Um, the whole idea of town meetings or participatory government and it was in meeting houses that uh, this whole form of government evolved and matured. Um, every town has its characters, and they all show up at town meeting. And, and you know who I'm talking about. And um, 
before they get up to speak, everybody knows what they're going to say, but they have a right to get up and say it. That, that was brand new, uh, and it's what the whole town meeting concept is all about. So every time I hear about town meetings or go to my deliberative session, I think that this whole process really started in meeting houses. Um, the debate over separation of church and state comes up again and again. In the most recent presidential election cycle, there was a debate whether churches should be allowed to endorse candidates, which has traditionally been interpreted as um, not separate from, from between uh, church and state. But every time I hear a debate of that sort, I have to remember that the uh, reason that we have separation of church and state, which is in the First Amendment to the federal constitution, is because as communities matured and more people of different faiths moved in, they began to be uncomfortable with paying tax to support a particular denomination's building and minister. And it was an evolutionary process. It didn't happen just overnight when the Bill of Rights were ratified. Uh, but it all came about because uh, of the uh, previous uh, custom of taxing people to, to support the building and, and the minister. And uh, finally, um, the Tea Party uh, is in the news a lot without indicating any uh, political leanings on my part. Every time I hear about the Tea Party nowadays, I have to remember that the original Tea Party, namely the Boston Tea Party, was organized in a meeting house. It was organized in the Old South Meeting House in Boston that still stands today on Washington Street. It's part of the Freedom Trail, if you've ever uh, walked that in Boston. And the British were so upset by this uh, fact that when they occupied Boston during the Revolution, they ripped out the interior of that building and they turned it into a horse riding arena. That's what they thought of the Tea Party. But every time I hear Tea Party in the current events, I have to remember, ah, the original one started in a meeting house. So that's just some of the, the things that tie these things in with, uh, with our lives today. Um, we are going to look at pictures of meeting houses, but I need to lecture you for about two minutes on who built them. Uh, they were built by the Puritans. So who were the Puritans? Uh, they were a byproduct of the Protestant Reformation, which started in Germany in 1517 when Martin Luther nailed up on his monastery door uh, some complaints against the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, his ideas spread like wildfire through Europe thanks to the new social media of the day, namely the printing press. And uh, several decades later, in England in 1536, King Henry VIII split the Church of England off from Rome for many, many reasons. Uh, the most popular one, of course, was he wanted a divorce from Catherine, his first wife, so he could marry Anne Boleyn to hopefully produce a male heir. And uh, we all know how that worked out. But uh, Rome would not grant him uh, a divorce, so he said, nuts with you. I'll form my own church, and that's where the Anglican Church, or in this country, the Episcopal Church, uh, originated. Uh, that was 1536. But there were people in England that did not think Henry had gone far enough in separating from Rome. They saw all of the stained glass and the elaborate cathedrals, the vestments, the ceremonies, the statues. They saw all those as getting in the way of the way they thought God should be approached. And they called these things idolatrous vanities. And so they worked for about 100 years to try to purify the Church of England, to get rid of all that stuff. And eventually they failed. Um, the church hierarchy in uh, 1630 got fed up with these guys and said, look, you've got two choices. Uh, you can go to the Tower of London over there, or you can get on that boat over there and go to New England and do whatever you wanted. And most people said, I'll take doorway number two. And so starting in 1630, that's when the real population of the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, began to, uh, to happen. And they, uh, they had a, a religion that was very different from the Anglican Church, but very strict in its own weird ways. Uh, they didn't treat women very well. Uh, you could have freedom of re religion as long as you believed exactly what the Calvinistic Puritans uh, thought. And if you didn't, they saw you as a threat to the colony because they saw the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony as a uh, colony that was set up and ordained by God uh, as, as an example of how a religious society should work. And if you didn't agree with them, that was a threat. So they, they ran you out of the colony. So that's a little bit of the uh, uh, background of uh, uh, the people who built these things. 
So what is a colonial meeting house? Many uh, towns still have meeting houses. Quakers meet in meeting houses. So what, from my artistic definition, is a colonial meeting house? Um, functionally, it's a building that was built for both town business and for worship. Uh, in early colonial times, it didn't make sense to build two buildings. Uh, people settled in communities who, uh, who were religiously like-minded, uh, and so they built one building for both functions. Uh, these were usually built with tax money. Again, that was, uh, people saw no problem with that. They were like-minded religiously. Um, there were some exceptions. Uh, the uh, colony of Rhode Island, they did not tax people for their meeting houses. Now a little, uh, little quiz. Can anybody remember from seventh grade geography class why that might be? Remember Roger Williams, the Baptist? Yeah. Yep. Baptists did not believe in supporting the church with tax money. And the Puritans thought this was a threat, so they, they ran Williams and his buddies out of the colony. They went south, formed a little uh, community called Providence, and that began the colony of Rhode Island, which was a Baptist colony. So meeting houses in Rhode Island were not built with tax money, but in general they were. Yours probably was uh, when it was built in 1755. And the meeting house was always the center of the community, both figuratively and literally. Everything happened in the meeting house, and the towns that still have them are very proud of the fact uh, that, uh, that they have a meeting house. And uh, a lot of them have been turned into some wonderful civic centers, uh, the one in Canaan, New Hampshire. Is, is an example that they've just not really modernized the building but made it functional for the 21st century. Okay, let's get some pictures. What does a meeting house look like? I already showed you uh, Danville and uh, Fremont. Uh, in general, uh, they were all quite similar, as I said. This is the meeting house in Millville, Massachusetts, uh, built in 1769. It's the Chestnut Hill Meeting House. And it is the quintessential um, uh, type of meeting house from the mid-18th century. Generally, they're two-story buildings, although I did see a couple of one-story ones. Uh, they have gable roofs with the uh, ridge line running east-west, which puts uh, the long wall facing south, not for any religious reason, but for a very practical reason. These buildings were never heated uh, in the 1700s. The chimney is probably uh, 1820, 1830. The reason they were never heated it was, uh, it was because it was the largest building in town and if it ever caught fire they couldn't put it out so they didn't allow heat in the building. So by building the long wall facing south in the winter you'd get all of the heat, the light and warmth from the sun uh, inside. So I like to think that they were building green uh, even in the 18th century. Um, they almost always had three doors. Uh, the gable end doors were for men and women to enter separately, at least earlier on. That's, that's one of the many rough edges of the Puritans that wore off after a while. But it was always traditional to put three doors on the meeting house, so they still did. The door on the long wall uh, was known as the door of honor. It was the door through which the minister and his honored, any honor, honored out-of-town guests would enter. Um, typically, the, on the outside, the windows are tucked right under the eaves. Uh, there's usually a very steep sloping roof, usually about a 12-pitch roof. And although you can't see it on this building around on the back, there is something called a pulpit window, which is a window that is right dead center in the wall, both up and down and, and back and forth. And it's the window behind the raised pulpit, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, so the, the preacher could read his notes or read from the Bible. So that is very typically what the outside of these buildings looked like. The inside uh, of them was also very very, very similar, if you'll excuse me, so I keep my voice going for the next uh, 45 minutes. These were very typically uh, clear story up uh, through the second floor. Um, there would be balconies on three sides. Uh, that's the west facing door and the east facing door is just coming into view. And the uh, center of attention in uh, Puritan times was this raised pulpit. Um, Worship in Puritan days was, was one-way communication. You listened to the preacher preach, pray, or read from the Bible. You didn't have hymns or responsive readings or any of that audience participation stuff that you might find in a church today. So the device over the pulpit is known as a sounding board. It's an acoustical device to project the preacher's uh, voice out into the auditorium. And uh, from up in the pulpit, 
uh, the preacher can see every eyeball in the entire place and can tell who's awake and who's asleep. And uh, Sunday worship in the 18th century was uh, not just a one hour and you're done kind of thing. It was several hours in the morning, you'd break for lunch, and then several hours in the afternoon. And it was very important not to fall asleep because there were uh, people at the time called tithing men that would go around with long poles with pricks on the end of them and wake people up. And it was a very embarrassing thing to be woken up that way. Uh, the uh, deacons would sit here. Uh, this very typically a little half round folding table, uh, hinged table there. They didn't celebrate communion very often. That was too much Roman Catholic. But on Easter and other uh, special days they would. And the uh, communi communion elements would be uh, set up there. Families would sit in these box pews. Um, families would own these pews. Uh, very typically, uh, a building might be financed, the outside of the building would be financed through tax money, and then they'd finish the interior by selling, selling building lots, essentially, and, and then they would build the, the box pews. Um, you'd own the pew, you'd have a deed to it, just like you would to any property. You could sell it, you could pass it down to, uh, to your heirs. And uh, although the Puritans were very egalitarian in many ways, where you sat in the meeting house was highly controlled by a committee who could decide based on your age, uh, how long you had lived in town, and how much money you had, and what other influences you had, who got the prime spots. And different meeting houses have different prime spots. Most of them are right up close to the pulpit. Uh, the Rocky Hill Meeting House in Amesbury, Massachusetts, the prime spots were all against the back wall. <laughs> they they kind of had the right idea as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, the reason for the walls on, on the box pews, I mentioned that these buildings are not heated. So in the wintertime, you could bring your little charcoal stove with you, right? You've probably seen those in museums. And uh, that would uh, keep your feet from freezing. And the walls would keep the drafts down, so, so you'd have a little warmth. And uh, because I'm a dog person, I really love this story. You could bring your dog with you uh, to worship. Now, if anybody who's ever had a dog uh, probably knows that uh, the dog's body temperature is several degrees warmer than yours. So in the winter, you'd bring your puppy with, with you, have him or her sit on your feet, and keep your feet from freezing uh, during uh, worship or town meetings. The, uh, the pew in the corner is uh, known as the slave pew. Slavery was not common in New England, but uh, there were some, and there were indentured servants, and they were expected to come uh, to meetings and to worship also. And uh, so that's a slave pew, and there's another one on the opposite balcony. And as I sit up there, I think that's the best seat in the house. Uh, first of all, you're not in the direct line of sight of the preacher. <laughs> you can basically see everyone else. And in the summertime, you've got this wonderful uh, 18th century air conditioner known as a window that you can open, north-facing window, and get a cool breeze. So this is what the inside and outside of these buildings almost always looked like in the 18th century, and I'm almost positive that yours probably looked that way too. I'll, I'll show you a picture of yours that Susan sent me later and make a few comments uh, about it. So to give you a tour uh, of uh, meeting houses, uh, let's talk about the three most important things in any real estate, location, location, location. Uh, the first question whenever a meeting house was to be built was always, where should we put the darn thing? Um, it was very important for people to have the meeting house to be close to their home or their farm because you had to show up every Sunday. Uh, you got a visit from the deacons if you didn't, and you better be on your deathbed. You just, you had to show up. And if the meeting house was far from your home, it was very difficult to get there in the winter. So people would lobby uh, for a long time to get the meeting house close to where they lived. And especially if you were a tavern owner, you would lobby to have the meeting house near your tavern because people got to go to lunch somewhere on Sundays. So sometimes these dis disputes would go on for years in towns. And uh, they'd have to call in the selectmen from a neighboring town to arbitrate where, where to put it. The town of Sandown, New Hampshire, this is the outside of the Sandown Meeting House that we're just looking at. Uh, Sandown Meeting House was built in 1773. So in town meeting in 1772, <coughs> Um, there was a warrant article, just like we have warrant articles today. Uh, there was a warrant article to raise and appropriate the amount of money needed for the meeting house. 
And the Warren article went on to appoint a building committee, and it charged the building committee with finding the geographic center of Sandown, and everybody thought that was a very fair way to locate the building. So the building committee got busy measuring from town boundary to town boundary, north to south and east to west, and they discovered that the geographic center of Sandown is what today is known as the Strawberry Swamp. <laughs> they didn't tell anybody. Uh, they just picked this other spot about a half a mile away. It was the top of a nice gentle hill, high and dry. Uh, they reported back to the selectmen that this was the center of Sandown, and everybody said, great, let's build the meeting house. So the me meeting house was built in 1773, and about 20 years later, uh, an accurate map of town was drawn, and people began to realize that the meeting house is not in the center of town. And a few of the committee members were still uh, alive, and they fessed up and said, yeah, we just kind of arbitrarily picked the spot. But by then, uh, it was too late, and everybody had basically accepted the meeting house where it uh, cu is currently located. Um, I think today we would call this an alternative fact. <laughs> Let's move the meeting house. Uh, in quite a number of communities, as the population moved around, they'd pick up the meeting house and drag it with them. Uh, the one that I want to talk about tonight is uh, this meeting house in Waldeboro, Maine. Um, this is the old German meeting house in Waldeboro. Uh, Waldeboro was settled by uh, a guy named General Samuel Waldo, who was perhaps the first corrupt land developer uh, in, in North America. Uh, <laughs> He went to the King of England and got a large tract of land in what today is the mid-coast Maine, and uh, then went to Germany and sold a bunch of poor peasants uh, to come to the land of milk and honey. And they did, and they built this building in 1772, but the first winter they were here, though, uh, they practically froze to death. But enough of them survived that this building got built in 1772, but uh, 22 years later in 1794, most of the population was on the other side of the Madomic River, which is one of these north-south salty things in mid-coast Maine. Uh, they'd built it on the east. Most of the population was on the west. And so in the winter of 1794, they took this building apart in sections. They dragged it across the ice and up a rather steep slope. Uh, this is about 50 feet above water level. Dragged it across uh, with horse and oxen. Uh, all with, and put it back together again, all without the aid of gasoline engines or electricity or cell phones or any of that stuff that we take for granted today. Um, uh, and so there it sits. The meeting house in Lempster, New Hampshire was also moved on rollers. And there's a building, building in Wickford, Rhode Island that I'll show you in a few minutes that was also moved in the uh, 1700s. Finally, where'd the town go? Sometimes you find a meeting house and there's really nothing around it. Um, an example is the Allenstown Meeting House, built in 1815, one of the few single-story ones, as I mentioned. Um, when Allenstown was uh, first built, this was the center of town, but today it is in the middle of the Bear Brook State Park. And no, the Park Service didn't move the Meeting House. This is just where Allenstown was. And when the railroads came in uh, a few decades later along the Suncook River, uh, people moved down there to where Allenstown is today and basically abandoned their homes. You don't even find cellar holes and the forest is completely grown up, but fortuitously the meeting house is still there. And uh, bored teenagers have not torn it or burned it down. The DAR, local DAR chapter, uh, takes care of it. So to move around further in New England, talking about meeting houses, let's talk about some superlatives. Uh, to give you some more examples of them. What's the oldest surviving meeting house? Uh, the oldest surviving meeting house would be this building in Hingham, Massachusetts, built in 1681. So a very, very old building, about 50 years after the Puritans started coming here. Uh, it's called the Old Ship Church because the inside of the roof beams are curved like the hull of a ship, but just upside down, which makes sense because Hingham is on the ocean and the building was probably built by shipwrights. Uh, it's a slightly different architectural style from uh, the uh, 18th century buildings. It's what Edmund Sinnott, in his 1963 book called A Type I Building, has a square footprint and a hipped roof, uh, a tower to uh, announce uh, when meetings were happening, uh, diamond pane windows, etc. But the inside is very similar to Sandown and the others. 
has box pews and, and a raised pulpit. Uh, and it, uh, there it still stands, 1681. It is today the first parish Unitarian Universalist church in Hingham, and it is the oldest church building in continuous use as a, as a church building in the United States. What's the oldest Anglican meeting house? Now, I know you're probably saying, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about, about the Puritans here, and in general we are. But there were several other uh, denominations that built buildings about the same time, including the Anglicans, including the Lutherans. That structure in Waldeboro, I slipped by you. That was a Lutheran structure. And uh, the Anglicans built buildings that were very, very similar to what the Puritans were building. Uh, this building in Wickford, Rhode Island, uh, built in 1707, is uh, St. Paul's Church. It's still owned by the Episcopal Church in town, which is St. Paul's. It's also known as the Old Narragansett Church. Um, notice the similarities uh, in, in style. Uh, very s steep roof, um, windows right under the eaves. They don't have three doors. The Anglicans didn't believe in that sort of thing. Uh, but notice the uh, round-topped windows. In rural meeting houses, that was just far too ostentatious for the Puritans. They didn't believe in round-topped windows, except for the pulpit window, that window behind the, the high pulpit. Uh, uh, sometimes the square ones could be elaborate. That was, uh, yeah, that was the, uh, uh, one of the hallmarks. The little round window in the attic I thought was unique until I uh, was giving this talk a few months ago and I put a picture of the uh, Washington, New Hampshire meeting house in. Dang, that one has a round <laughs> window in it. So in general, these did not have round windows or round topped windows. The interiors are very similar. The interior of this is very similar. It's got box pews and a raised pulpit. Uh, they have an altar. Uh, Anglicans have an altar for celebrating Holy Communion. Puritans would never do that. That's far too popish. Uh, the Anglicans have places to kneel. Again, the Puritans would never do that. That's far too Roman Catholic. But their buildings were, uh, uh, still neat to photograph anyway, so a few of them s snuck into the project. Uh, this is the uh, oldest Episcopal church north of the Potomac River, and it has an organ which is believed to be the oldest organ continuously used for religious purposes uh, in America. Um, Puritans, again, did not have organs. They didn't have music at all. That was, that was far too popish, as they would say. What's the oldest town hall in continuous use? As the 19th century progressed and uh, uh, the, uh, what was then the Congregational Church, the Puritans became the Congregationalists around 1740. Uh, the congregation, if the Congregational Church moved out of the meeting house, the town would take it over and it would uh, continue on as a town hall. And I suspect that's what happened in your meeting house because you called it a townhouse after a while. Uh, so what's the one that's in been in continuous use uh, the longest? Uh, that would be this building in Pelham, Massachusetts, uh, built in 1743. Uh, Pelham refers to this building as their old town hall, but it, it was originally their meeting house. You can tell that by looking at the back wall and uh, right there is where the pulpit window used to be. You know, the fire escape is obviously new and the propane tanks and stuff, but that's, like I said, the pulpit window is the hallmark of an 18th century meeting house. Anyway, they claim to have had town meeting in this building continuously every year uh, for the longest uh, period of time of any building uh, in the United States. And uh, here's my own personal theory of how they maintain this, this record. Town meeting is usually in March, right? It's cold. Yeah, there's a little heat in this building, but it's uh, still pretty chilly. Uh, so I think what happens is on the morning of town meeting, the town moderator and uh, the uh, selectmen and several citizens from the town gather in this building. Uh, the moderator uh, calls the meeting to order, and somebody uh, immediately makes a motion to uh, take a recess. Uh, they get up, go out, get in their cars, and drive down the street to the auditorium of the grammar school where anybody with any <laughs> brains in their head have already gathered for town meeting. But they've had town meeting in this building, they claim, every year since 1743. Uh, another piece of trivia about this, this building, um, Pelham, New Hampshire is near Northampton, New Hampshire. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, around 1740 was the time of the Great Awakening, and there was a famous uh, itinerant preacher who was based in Northampton named Jonathan Edwards that you may have heard of. Uh, Jonathan Edwards preached the dedication service in this building in 1743. Little piece of American history. What's the oldest steeple on a meeting house? Now, steeples, uh, meeting houses, rural ones at least, did not have steeples. Again, that was either too ostentatious or too much money, probably, for a rural community. Uh, urban meeting houses did have steeples, and the oldest steeple on a meeting house is this building. This is the Old South Meeting House that I mentioned a while ago in Boston. Um, the interior of the building has been many, many other things. Uh, it started out as a meeting house. It was a horse riding arena during the, uh, the Revolution. It went back to being a worship space. Uh, it was a U.S. post office for a while, and today it's basically a museum space on the Freedom Trail. So as you go through, through the interior of the building, it's like going through an archaeological dig. There's all these pieces of the building from different periods, but the outside is still original. Uh, including the steeple. This is the original 1729 uh, steeple uh, that uh, still exists. And I dare say the neighborhood probably did not look like this when this building was built. Um, Old South, uh, you've probably all heard of the Bo Great Boston Fire of 1872, somewhere in, in, your, in your travels. Uh, the Great Boston Fire stopped about a block away from this building, so fortuitously it was, uh, it was saved. This is the oldest steeple in New Hampshire. I spoke in this building back in January, and they made a big deal about having the oldest steeple in a rural meeting house. And so I gave this talk at uh, Historic Deerfield uh, a number of months ago, and somebody from um, Weathersfield, Connecticut, put up his hand and said, what about the Weathersfield meeting house? And I looked up in Sinnott's book, and dang, yeah, the Weathersfield meeting house has an older steeple. So this is at least the oldest one in New Hampshire. I need to write to the people in Amherst and, and correct them. Their steeple was built in 1772. Uh, second oldest, I believe, is Hampstead, New Hampshire, not far from where I live. The building is older, but the steeple was built in 1792. Look at the, uh, the, the shape of the steeple. This, this uh, very pointed shape is the same on all three of these buildings. That's known as a Puritan steeple. It was very common in the 1700s and early 1800s to build steeples that uh, had that structure to them. What's the building with the most original glass? Now, why would glass be important? Glass was expensive uh, in colonial times, and so if, uh, if you were a town that could afford a lot of glass, again, this is one of the very subtle ways that the Puritans would kind of be one up on their neighbors. If you could put a lot of glass in your meeting house, uh, you were demonstrating to the world that you were a very wealthy town. And the building with the most original glass still remaining is, I believe, this building in Amesbury, Massachusetts. It's the Rocky Hill Meeting House in Amesbury, built in 1785. And uh, I'm told that about 75% of the panes of glass in this building are the original 1785 uh, panes of glass. It's just, just amazing that it's, it's lasted that long. And I'm just glad I don't have to wash all those windows. <laughs> Now, there's um, three things you need to remember about this building, and uh, they're going to be on the final exam uh, in a few minutes. And because uh, I can't test all of you, uh, I'm going to let Susan be the class representative since you invited me. So, Susan, there's three things you need to remember. One, it was built in 1785. You can write this open book, so you can write notes. Um, it's in Amesbury, which is near Newburyport. That's significant. And it was built by a local master builder named Timothy Palmer, P-A-L-M-E-R, Timothy Palmer. Got to remember those three things. We will come back to that. <laughs> What's the best restoration? Uh, I saw quite a number of buildings that uh, um, were morphed into other things and, and then reversed. Uh, the one I wanted to talk about tonight is uh, this building in West Barnstable, Mass. Uh, uh, built in 1717. West Barnstable, this building is right off the Mid Cape Highway. Um, so 1717 is a fairly old building. Uh, and in the mid-1800s, uh, about 1850, uh, it's a congregational church, the congregation voted to modernize their building. So they took down the tower that existed, 
Uh, they took off this appendage, which is called a porch. That's got a stairwell in it. They put the main entrance on the narrow end of the building. Uh, they ripped out the pews on the inside and put an aisle running lengthwise from one gable end to the other and put their, their pulpit up there. And uh, starting in 1850, they put a little dinky steeple on, on the roof, really quite embarrassing, I think. Uh, and for about 100 years, this was just a very nondescript rural congregational church until about 1950 when somebody realized, hey, I think they made a mistake 100 years ago. Uh, and they got an effort to get together to undo some of that and bring the church building back to an earlier period, not to 1717. They brought it back to the early 1800s uh, when, when the tower was, was added. They knew what the tower looked like because there was a sketch and they knew about the, the stairwell, the porch and things, but they didn't really know much about what the woodwork looked like inside until they realized in, in, 19, in 1850 when the building was uh, ripped apart that the uh, wood from the pews was sold at auction and there were several dining rooms in West Barnstable that had wainscoting on the walls that were made from the old uh, pew wood so the carpenters could go in with their calipers and exactly duplicate the moldings that were used. You know, you didn't go to Home Depot to buy moldings in those days. Carpenters brought their own planes and they made all their own moldings. And that's one of the ways you can tell, in some cases, who built what because the, the planes would also be handmade and so everybody's plane was a little bit different. So they can tell who built things very often from looking at the moldings. But that's, uh, that's how they recreated the pews in this building. Um, it's marvelous. I've, I've been to, to a church service there, a church service a number of years ago. You walk in and you think you're in the early 1800s. There's light and heat. Uh, there's still no plumbing. If you want that, you go to the parish house. But there's light and heat, but it's all recessed, so you don't see it. And you really, you really think you're back, uh, back in the um, about 1820s, uh, early 19th century. What's the biggest dispute? I, I already mentioned that where to locate the meeting house was very frequently a, a bone of contention. Uh, the story I wanted to tell, though, took place in the little town of Brooklyn, Connecticut. Uh, Brooklyn is in eastern Connecticut, sort of on the uh, uh, midway up the, uh, the border with uh, Rhode Island. Uh, this is their meeting house, uh, built in 1771. It's on their town green. Uh, the steeple, notice the Puritan steeple again, the steeple was added in the early 1800s. Uh, so when this building was being proposed in town meeting in 1770, um, there was a warrant article, et cetera, et cetera, that raised and appropriated the money and it assessed everyone in town in proportion to their property, very much like we have property tax today. It assessed everyone their portion of the fee to build this building. And there was a, uh, a family in town, a man named uh, Godfrey Melbourne, who had recently moved from uh, Newport, Rhode Island, where he had been a member of Trinity Church, the Episcopal Church, or Anglican Church then in, in uh, Newport. And uh, he had a lot of land, and he was assessed like 20% of the cost of this building, and he really didn't want to contribute to the, what was then the Congregational Church. So uh, there was a uh, colonial law in Connecticut at, th at that time. It was one of the transitional laws separating church and state. There was a colonial law that said, if you're a member of another denomination and if that denomination got their building finished before the town finished its building, then you did not have to pay your assessment. So Melbourne got together with uh, 10 or 12 other families, uh, got themselves sponsored as a mission church of Trinity Church Newport, uh, Rhode Island, and they got bu busy building their building. And because they did not need to go back to town meeting to make all their decisions, they got their building built first. And uh, uh, it was this uh, structure that uh, they built. They got it done a few months uh, ahead of uh, the town and, and didn't have to pay the, uh, the assessment for the, the meeting house. Notice the uh, round-topped windows. Uh, you know you have an Anglican structure. And I just had to mention that uh, you're having a paranormal event coming up in a few weeks. This cemetery, I didn't notice anything when I was there, but evidently it's one of the hotbeds of paranormal activity in, in New England. And uh, since I've written the book and done the talk, I occasionally get emails from people wanting to know if they can get in like I run it and I don't. It's, uh, it's still owned by, uh, the, it's Trinity Church in, in, uh, in uh, 
uh, Brooklyn's. Uh, the Episcopal Church built their new building around 1850, and this is used for weddings and, and summer worship, that sort of thing. What's the building that's been used for the most other things? Uh, many of these buildings were repurposed, as I mentioned, uh, and have served many, many purposes. Uh, the one I wanted to talk about was uh, the Linfield Meeting House in Linfield, Massachusetts, just north of Boston, uh, built in 1714. Um, when it was first built, it looked just like all the others I've been showing you. It had a pulpit window in the back and the three doors. This would be the back of the building, so there used to be a door of honor on the front, and, and uh, it had uh, balconies around the three sides and raised pulpit, just, just like all the others. Uh, that was in 1714. Um, in 1836, so 120 years later, basically, a floor was added. Uh, and uh, the uh, Congregational Church at that point had built their new building, which is right behind where I'm standing. A floor was added, and it served as the town hall downstairs and a, a meeting space upstairs. Uh, that was 1836. After 1892, uh, it was the town's primary school. Uh, they evidently divided the interior into various classrooms, and it served as their primary school starting in 1892. In the early 1900s, it was their fire station. Uh, they took off uh, some of the wall on that end and put some large doors and parked fire apparatus in there. And uh, starting in 1960, the Linfield Historical Society has taken it over and has been slowly trying to undo uh, all of this uh, abuse uh, to their building. Uh, this is also a good example, though, of something else that I saw a number of times as I traveled around New England. This building was enlarged in 1782, back when it was still a meeting house. And the way they enlarged it was they cut the building in half, dragged the halves apart, and they filled in the middle. I thought this was just the stupidest thing until <laughs> somebody in one of my talks who was a timber framer said, Paul, you know, look, it's a lot of work to timber frame an end wall. You know, look at all those windows you got to account for and the door and the whole truss system for the roof. That's a lot of work. It's a lot less work to cut the building in half, pull it apart, put in a few new roof trusses, and fill in the middle. And I saw that here. Uh, there's a large um, uh, congregational church in East Derry that was enlarged that way. And there's also uh, what is today the Episcopal Church in West Claremont was enlarged that way. If you go up in the attic, you'll notice uh, in all of these buildings that the trusses in the middle are a little bit different. That's because that's the way they enlarged the building. What's the most interesting graveyard? Now, as I uh, traveled around New England doing the photography for this project, um, I would also like to uh, uh, stop and smell the roses from time to time. By that, I mean if there's a cemetery nearby, go have a look at it and see if there's anything interesting that can be found. And the most interesting one, uh, I think, was it right next to the Danville Meeting House uh, in uh, Danville, New Hampshire. For here is buried one Josiah Philbrick, uh, who died in 1863 at 64 years of age. That's not too terribly unusual. Um, just as a side note, though, I love the things that they write on gravestones. Let me read this one to you. It's really good. Oh, may this death remind us all that here we've no abiding place. But the next shaft of death that falls may call us to our resting place. Isn't that a cheery thought? <laughs> anyway, Josiah Philbrick, um, buried right next to him is his wife, Sarah P., wife of Josiah Philbrick, died in 1870, a few years after him. Uh, that's not too unusual. Uh, right next to her is a uh, Sarah Q., uh, infant daughter of Josiah and Sarah Philbrick. Okay, it's a little unusual maybe to name girls after their mothers, but usually it's boys that get named after their fathers, but I suppose you could name a girl after her mother. Uh, but as we uh, look on the other side of Mr. Philbrick, there is another Sarah. Starting to notice a pattern here. Another Sarah, wife of Josiah Philbrick, uh, and daughter of etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And if you look at the dates, this Sarah predeceased the other one we just saw. And if that's not enough, parked right next to her is another Mrs. Sarah Philbrick, wife of Josiah Philbrick, uh, 
uh, et cetera, et cetera, who predeceased the other two. So this is the original Sarah. Uh, and if you look at the dates, this would have been the mother of the infant daughter who died, and the mother probably died in childbirth. That's the sad story, but the, the funny one, the interesting one is here is Josiah Philbrick and his four Sarahs. <laughs> uh, I sometimes wonder if uh, Mr. Philbrick had trouble talking in his sleep, perhaps, and in order to avoid problems around the house, married women with all the same first name. I, I don't know. Finally, uh, I saw a lot of street signs as I drove around. There's some really good ones out there. Um, Holderness, New Hampshire, has a street called To the Dump Road that you can't guess where that goes, right, to the transfer station. Uh, it reminds me of a, a joke, where does the Lone Ranger take his garbage? To the dump, to the dump, to the dump, dump, dump. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I've not seen this one, but they tell me in Bosco in New Hampshire there's a street called Electric Lane which is not unusual except the sign right under it says, no outlet. <laughs> but the, uh, the very finest uh, street sign, I think, uh, is in the little town of Ulna, Maine, right down the street from their meeting house. And I believe this is the finest example of dry Maine humor I have ever seen because the little road that leads to their town cemetery is called That's it. Can't, can't make this stuff up. Okay, what happened to meeting houses? Why don't we have meeting houses anymore? Two things. Uh, the first, I've alluded to the whole notion of separation of church and state, uh, which was uh, in the First Amendment to the Federal Constitution that was ratified in 1791. Does anybody remember when New Hampshire got around to changing its state law to be in, in, in line with the Federal Constitution? It was the Tolerance Act of 1819, so a couple of decades. But uh, as I said, the whole separation of church and state was an evolutionary process that took place for quite a while before and quite a while after uh, the First Amendment. Uh, but this presented a lot of problems for towns that only had one building. And so what do you do? You know, okay, we've got to separate church and state here. Uh, many towns in true New England frugality built a floor at the uh, balcony level uh, and had church upstairs and town hall downstairs. Uh, many, many buildings did. And uh, I suspect yours, I know, had a floor and so that may have been what happened here. So in uh, a lot of places, if you go into a, usually an older congregational church and have to go upstairs to get to the sanctuary, if it was built in the 1700s, uh, that's probably why that it was split up and town hall was downstairs for a while. The town of Ringe, uh, down on the Massachusetts border, this was their meeting house built in 1796. It looked just like Sandown and all the others. Uh, in uh, 1839, uh, they built a floor, uh, made it a two-story building, um, put on a steeple, and uh, to get to uh, the sanctuary, you'd go in, in, in upstairs, and to get to town hall, as late as the mid-1990s, you would go in uh, what used to be the Door of Honor. And uh, the town still owns the first floor of this building. Um, uh, there's a number of other towns around the, the, that have the same arrangement. So uh, separation of church and state was one of the things that uh, motivated people to, to uh, get rid of meeting houses. The other was uh, perhaps a more significant, uh, wide-reaching thing. It was a book. I'm speaking in a library, so I'm glad to sort of plug books here for a minute. Um, there was a book uh, written by a Asher Benjamin in 1797 called A Country Builder's Assistant. Uh, Benjamin was a contemporary of Charles Bulfinch, who is uh, better known for a lot of big buildings. Uh, he built the uh, uh, Massachusetts State House, for example. But uh, Asher Benjamin perhaps had a wider reach because uh, up until the late 1700s, country builders didn't really have architects to work from. They copied one another. So Benjamin's book um, contained lots of information about how to build things to look nice. So you'll find uh, patterns in there for doors, windows, railings, stairs, banisters, fireplace mantles, all of these things that we consider to be quintessential uh, New England architecture really originated from his book. And on plate 27 of that book, 
is something he calls a plan for a church. Now up until this point, the term church was generally used not for the building, but it was used for the people, the organization, the body of the church, but he calls it a church, a uh, plan for a church. It's, it's a design after a uh, Christopher Wren structure in London, I understand. And as I drive around New England, I have seen that building on many, many, many town greens. And it was all based on the fact that uh, when the 1800s started, people wanted to worship in one of these things and not in one of those old boxy meeting houses. To give you an example of a building uh, that was uh, pretty much patterned after uh, the book, here's the front elevation from the book. And here is the first religious society of Newburyport, Massachusetts, uh, built in 1801. And you cannot uh, convince me that the building of this building did not see the book. The steeple came from somewhere else, but look at the front of this building. Uh, you've got the window over the door. You've got three doors. We still got three doors on meeting houses, folks, three doors. Uh, the front portico is bumped out from the building. Look at the detailing around the, uh, the, the uh, eaves and things. Uh, look at the little half round window. You can't tell me that this builder did not see the book. Now, Susan, yes. exam time. Who do you suppose built this building? <laughs> you can look back Timothy at your Palmer. Timothy Palmer, ding, 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 ding. Same builder. How many years later is it? Well, it's, it's 1785 it, to 1801. 16 so. years later, right. five miles away. That's how quickly tastes changed, and people didn't want meeting houses anymore. And so that's where this whole style of building came from. Uh, here's uh, the interior elevation from the book, uh, from Benjamin's book. And here's a not very good photograph of the interior of that building, because it's not one of mine. Um, look at how the pulpit is, is structured. It's up on pillars, uh, stairs on both sides. Look at the window over it. It's almost a carbon copy from the book. So that's what happened to meeting houses. Sometimes, uh, in order to uh, uh, produce something that didn't look like a meeting house, uh, towns would take their, uh, or take their meeting house and turn it into one of Asher Benjamin's buildings. And in order to do that quite frequently, since the long wall used to be the main entrance and the long wall would face the street, it, uh, in order to have the entrance through the short end of the building, uh, they would pick the building up and rotate it and put it down and then uh, put a steeple on the end of it. And uh, this is the uh, former meeting house in Southampton, Massachusetts that was built in 1788, looked just like all the others. In um, 1882, the tower was added and in 1840, the building was turned uh, 90 degrees so that the short end faced the street and it was turned into what we would today consider to be a very typical New England Congregational Church. So let's talk about Bedford just a little bit. Uh, I mentioned before uh, that uh, I'm quite positive that your original meeting house built in 1775 was very, very similar to the ones that I've just been showing. Uh, so this meeting house, uh, Susan sent me the picture. It says it was built in 1775 and it's from 17, I'm sorry, 1832 to 1876. It was your townhouse, so probably used for town meetings and uh, as town hall. Uh, there was something in uh, a history that you sent that talked about a creaking floor uh, there would have been a floor at that time and there was some sort of meeting going on and, and people started to hear strange noises and were concerned that the building might collapse and they all uh, emptied out of the building. That floor was probably not original. As, as I've said, these buildings were almost always clear story through the second floor with balconies on three sides, uh, three doors, two in the gable ends and one on the, the front. I suspect, I don't know what orientation this is, but I suspect that this is the back wall. Anybody notice what's missing from your back wall? It's no pulpit window. So somewhere around 1832 probably they took, when they took the pews out, they probably took the pulpit out and took the pulpit window out. Um, if the building were still here, we'd go look at the clabberds. Sometimes you can see where the clabberds have been uh, altered, but anyway. Um, I suspect this photograph was probably made close to 1876. Uh, photography did not exist before 1832, so this is certainly in uh, probably towards the end of its, of its life. You know, the 
Do I know the location? I haven't the foggiest idea. <laughs> same location. Same location. Yeah, 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 yeah. So your current uh, town hall was built 1909, 1910? 1910. It is a very historically significant structure, but it's far too young for my book. So that, that's why it's not in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very. It might have been the second one. The second could be yeah. the second one burned in 1909. I think I, I read. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Could be. Okay, uh, let me finish up by talking a little bit about the artistic work. Uh, all the color photographs I've been showing you were digital and basically uh, made to show what the buildings look like. Um, I work artistically with something called a view camera. Uh, this is uh, probably the same technology from about 1880, 1890, except the lens is better and the film is better. Uh, it's a very simple device. Uh, there's a lens with a mechanical shutter and mechanical diaphragm. Uh, there's a bellows to keep the dark inside. And uh, there's a place in the back to put a film pack uh, so that when you make the exposure, if you've ever seen somebody at one of these cameras and they're pulling the slide out, what they're doing is the film pack has a, has a dark slide so the film doesn't get exposed when you're carrying it around in daylight. And once the film pack is inserted into the camera and you remember to close the shutter, which I forget to do sometimes, once that happens, it's dark on the inside and you can pull that slide out. Now the film is open so that it can be exposed uh, when, you, uh, when you make the photograph. Uh, you'll notice there's no viewfinder on, on this camera. The way you focus the camera is you take the film pack out and there is a uh, frosted glass called a ground glass that snaps into place in exactly the same place the film will be when you put film in the camera. And you open up the shutter, open up the diaphragm, and the lens throws on this ground glass the exact image that the film is going to see. And in order to see that in daylight, uh, you have a cloth called a dark cloth that you throw over your head. You know? So if you've ever seen an old movie with the guy under the cloth, right? that's me under that cloth. Uh, <laughs> Here I am at the Lempster meeting house. I think I'm photographing the door, uh, demonstrating my use of a dark cloth. I take my artistic work very religiously. Um, here I am in one of my more prayerful moods. Uh, I think I'm photographing a, a, a fire escape in that, uh, that photograph. Uh, I still work in a wet dark room. Uh, who was I talking to before that has an enlarger? You do. You need to get that enlarger out of the closet <laughs> and set it up. Uh, this is set up for developing film. I have a, a machine called a Jobo processor, which is a German machine uh, that very evenly will uh, um, uh, agitate the film for very even development. It's not made anymore, so if you want to buy one of these on eBay, it's more expensive than they were when they were made because uh, they're just scarce. Uh, here's the same room set up for developing prints. Uh, my enlarger is on this table just out of, out of sight in the corner. There's a developer, stop bath, fixer, and uh, various wash baths for uh, washing prints when you're done. Uh, I like the tactile nature of working in a dark room with photographs. I, I worked at a computer during a day job for far too long to feel terribly artistic uh, at a computer. But I just, I just love the mood of, of, uh, of working. Uh, it's a very zen-like process, uh, working in a dark room. Uh, an example of some of the things I go through to make my photographs out in the field. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm photographing, that's the pulpit window on the back of the Rocky Hill Meeting House in Amesbury. And people who use these cameras like to eliminate converging lines in the photograph. Uh, you know, if you take a normal camera and point it up at a building, the building kind of leans in, right? It's called keystoning. You can eliminate that with one of these by keeping the back absolutely vertical and just raising the lens. That keeps all the lines in perspective. But there's only so far you can do that. You run out of, of image uh, if you go too far. So sometimes I just need to get the camera up off the ground. And uh, so I, I drive around uh, with uh, this roof platform that I can set up on my Volvo. Uh, if you've ever seen, uh, there's a famous photograph of Ansel Adams out in the middle of the desert someplace on the top of his uh, 1935 Woody uh, making a photograph. I figured if that's good enough for Ansel, it's good enough for me. <laughs> and uh, here's the photograph I made uh, at that time. Now I said you try to keep the lines all, all parallel to the edge of the picture, but you'll notice if you kind of look at this, it kind of looks like the window is leaning to the left. 
right? That's because the window's leaning to the left. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the ground glass on one of these cameras, there's a grid line so that you can kind of line things up. And uh, on a couple of occasions, I just worked like crazy trying to get a window to line up with the grid lines until I realized that the silly window is not square. Uh, and uh, what I would do in that situation is I would line up the sill, or sill of the window or the, the clapboards and just let the window do whatever it wants to do. You know, after a couple of hundred years, walls kind of do those kinds of things. Uh, another example of uh, work that I do to make a photograph, this is in uh, the inside of the same building uh, in uh, Amesbury. Now these are municipal structures, you know, there's no stained glass or anything, there's not even a cross on the wall like you would find in, in most churches today. But as I was up in the balcony, uh, finished make, making a photograph up there, I leaned over to ask a question of the person who was babysitting me, basically, while I was in their building. And uh, I looked down and I realized right here at the intersection of those box pews, there's a cross in those pews. How can I make a photograph of that to look like a cross? So I had to go off and do some woodworking, which is my other great joy in life. Uh, I built a plywood uh, contraption that I could put a tripod head on the end. Uh, I made it so it would gently clamp to the balcony so as not to mar their precious building. Uh, the uh, lens is exactly centered over the intersection of the pews using a, a plumb bob. Uh, there's a uh, 45 degree angle mirror so I can see that ground glass. Uh, I went to the drugstore and bought a pair of those reading glasses that had exactly the right focal length so I could see the ground glass. And uh, here's the photograph that uh, produces one of my favorites for a number of reasons. It's what Ansel Adams described as pre-visualization. You, you see a photograph and then it's sometimes a simple matter to go through the steps and sometimes not so simple as with this. Um, now, I mentioned that in uh, Puritan worship, um, they didn't have any music. And so I needed some music for uh, my, uh, my slideshow. And there's uh, uh, a colonial era, uh, born in 1744, uh, and I'm searching for the name, so let me grab. Do you ever have senior moments? <laughs> <sighs> I hate when that happens. William Billings, William Billings. Anybody ever hear of William Billings? Probably not. It's usually just the church organist who's heard of William Billings. Uh, built, uh, born in uh, 1744, died in 1800, and lived in Boston. And so he was writing music right at the period when all of these buildings uh, were uh, being built and used. But as I said, uh, they did not have organs or instruments of any sort in uh, Puritan buildings. And so all of his music, music is a cappella. And so I needed some, some piano music for my slideshow. And I had a very dear friend named Christopher Dralick, who tragically died of a brain hemorrhage at age 39 a couple of years ago. Uh, but he was a brilliant, brilliant musician, and he could just do um, piano impersonations or interpretations, uh, improvisations, that's the word, piano improvisations based on almost any theme. And so I said, Chris, I need some music for my slideshow. Uh, I need, could you play some William Billings, and could you give me the cocktail lounge version of William Billings? So that's where the, the music came from. I'm going to play this, and uh, it takes about two and a half minutes, and then I will be back uh, to take your questions. Here we go. Hopefully the sound is still working. Yes. Yes. 
Thank you very much.